uh, anyways, um, when you quantize a classical particle in a box, you end up with a Helmholtz equation. And when you look at the, the eigenstates of such systems, you, just, you see things like this. So um, anyways, that's just an illustration. Um, what I thought I would do is uh, try to go through a slow process of defining what, what uh, quantum chaos is. Um, it's not entirely obvious um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of which is the, the term quantum chaos is an oxymoron, um, if you like. Uh, if you think of an isolated bounded quantum system, you can't really have a chaotic system. It's a linear system. There's no Lyapunov exponents. There's no exponential instability. And so um, we need to give meaning to this uh, phrase, recognizing that it's a, a, um, an oxymoron. So, I'll just talk about uh, some basic definitions. It's easiest to talk about integrability in terms of um, uh, particle systems as opposed to field theories. So I'll, I'll just talk about it in a very simple way um, and kind of go through that. And then just maybe touch on some places where it looks like quantum chaos is going in recent years. So uh, I'll do this all in a very hand-waving kind of uh, superficial way, I guess. So uh, that's kind of the plan uh, for today. So um, if you're like me, you're old enough that when you were a kid, you played with a spirograph, like probably kids today don't even know what they are. Um, however, um, if you were a little physicist, you might have thought, oh, hey, when I'm, you know, you're making, you're taking your pencil and drawing a figure, hey, this has uh, two constants of the motion. It's a two degree of freedom system with two constants of motion. Uh, probably most kids didn't think about it that way. Um, but for example, if you look at the far right, that's a system which would imitate the kind of dynamics you would have if angular momentum and energy are both conserved. It's two degrees of freedom and you get nice Lissajou patterns anytime you have as many constants of motion as you have uh, degrees of freedom. This is why it's easier when you have a finite number of degrees of freedom to define what you mean by integrability. As soon as you go to a field theory and you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, it becomes way more complicated. So just for today, we'll only talk about uh, this at this level, but integrability is just this idea of having um, n constants of motion and involution uh, for a classical system. Okay. Um, so now you go back to the 1890s and Lyapunov does a whole thesis on instability of solutions to uh, certain uh, classes of equations and introduces his whole stability theory. And now that's known as, uh, I mean, the Lyapunov exponents uh, come out of that work. Um, but the real beginning of chaotic dynamical um, uh, uh, dynamical studies, I think starts with uh, Poincare's uh, treatise on the three body problem. He was doing all this celestial mechanics and he wrote these books. And um, in those books, he talks about everything like heteroclinic orbits, homoclinic orbits. He defines stable and unstable manifolds. He tells you the geometry of chaos is so complicated. It gives him a headache even trying to imagine it. All that stuff's in his book from 1899. Um, and here we have another two degree of freedom system, a double pendulum. Uh, so it's just like the spirographs, two degrees of freedom. But if you put a light bulb at the end of mass two right here, you put a little light bulb on it, turn the lights out and you set it in motion. If you give it enough energy, um, the end, you can see the position of the, the end of the second mass or where the mass two is. Uh, develops a pattern like this, and that's completely different than the patterns you saw in the spirograph. And just like you can quantize those systems, you could quantize this, but the question becomes, are there phenomena when you quantize it that are completely different than in the other case? Are there new phenomena, things like that? So, um, so let's just reiterate this issue there's just really no chaos in isolated bounded quantum mechanical systems, especially if you're thinking of something like the Schrodinger equation. 
uh, no Lyapunov exponents, no butterfly effect, no topological entropies like the KS entropy, all that stuff is really absent. Um, and so, you know, what do you mean by quantum chaos? Well, if you talk to Martin Gutzfeiler, who is uh, the person who got the Danny Heinemann prize for coming out with periodic orbit theory in the late 60s, um, he was always saying that he wanted to see how chaos emerged from quantum mechanics. There's no chaos in quantum mechanics, but it's there in classical mechanics, so somehow it has to emerge out of quantum mechanics. I always found that a little backwards because I thought it was more valuable, in my own opinion, to say, okay, we're gonna quantize a classical system. Are there new quantum phenomena we should be looking for when we look at those systems? So um, it's kind of the inverse thing, but everybody had different opinions. And um, if you go back to the origins uh, of this, it really goes back, in my opinion, to um, Niels Bohr in the 30s when he started talking about compound nuclei. And if you don't know what a, the compound nucleus concept was, they were scattering neutrons and protons off nuclei, and the nucleus occasionally would absorb one, and there was a binding energy, and all that energy was available for all the valence nucleons to partition that energy. And the way they acted was like, um, a, uh, like a hard wall gas. It was basically like trapped in a bag by the core of the nucleus, but the valence particles were bouncing off each other in essence, um, like a chaotic system. And he described that in his 36 paper. Um, and that was like in the 50s when uh, Wigner came out with random matrix theory and all that stuff to describe the quantum fluctuation properties of such systems. Um, so for a long time, there were sort of two camps, uh, one sort of defining quantum chaos as a uh, random matrix theory, um, which was introduced by Wigner. And then there was another camp uh, that was very interested in asymptotic analysis of these systems that spoke about it as, as basically just periodic orbit theory. Um, so I, I think of it as, as uh, something more uh, broad than that. And um, you can even apply the term in cases where you don't have a classical analog of your quantum system and, and things of that nature. So it, it's, uh, it's a little more complicated. So just to give you um, an idea. So it, it kind of started out in strongly interacting many body systems. That's what the compound nucleus was. So if you look at slow neutron resonances, which was really important for reactor design and all that stuff in the 50s, um, all those measurements, the quantum fluctuations were sort of the progenitor or, or like the impetus for developing this, this field. Um, and after that, it evolved in lots of different ways into pure and applied mathematics, uh, mesoscopic systems, lots of other places. Um, and it, it got into single particle quantum mechanics through the Boegus Giannani Schmidt conjecture in which they said, well, it may have started out being intended for strongly interacting many body systems, but it's true of any chaotic system, no matter how simple it is. These, you'll see the same quantum fluctuations in a quantum billiard as you will in a compound nucleus. So, um, so then there was a period of time when there was a lot of single particle quantum mechanics stuff done. And now it's kind of coming back to many body physics again. Uh, so here's, here's just a few um, illustrations of places where um, uh, ideas from quantum chaos are being applied. Um, maybe it's kind of obvious that the quantum dot sort of thing is, uh, is like a single particle chaos uh, kind of uh, system. Uh, but maybe what's less obvious is if you think about um, parity violation, which is due to the weak force, that's a 10 to the minus seven like uh, uh, size force, right? Compared to, um, compared to the strong force. Um, you can find resonances in the, in the nucleus where there are 10% 10, 10 effects. And Part of this, about three orders of magnitude of the enhancement is explained by kinematic factors having to do with the distinction between S and P wave resonances. The other three more orders of magnitude um, of uh, enhancement uh, of the size of the effects of parity violation are really due to chaotic dynamics and the mixing that's uh, going on in the compound nucleus. Um, 
I'd also maybe just point to the long range ocean acoustics and anything you say about quantum chaos, you can also talk about wave chaos and optics and acoustics. It, it applies equally there as well. Any, any kind of linear wave equation would, would show or have the same kinds, of, um, same kinds of effects. So anyways, there's lots of experimental places where um, these ideas have found application. Um, so maybe if I just sort of uh, summarize maybe the simplest phenomena that were initially discussed, um, since you want to look at quantum fluctuation properties, the first thing they were looking at was the position of the slow neutron resonances and how the spacing between those resonances behave. And what they found is that there are two features uh, in the statistics. One you would call level repulsion. You almost never find too close S wave resonances or too close P wave resonances if they have the same spin. Um, and also there's a long range, rigid, long range rigidity to the spectrum. If you look at an interval of the spectrum where you expect to find N levels, the variations in that are log N, not square root of N. If you take a Poissonian sequence that's supposed to be, uh, you know, you're supposed to have N events in it, you'll get plus or minus square root of N events in that interval. Um, in random matrix theory and in slow neutron resonances in quantum dots, you see log N, you see universal conductance fluctuations, but you see logarithmic behavior instead of square root of N. So the fluctuations and the spacings and the the spectrum are extremely different between Poisson and RMT, and Barry and Tabor proved that if you have an integrable system, you're going to see Poissonian statistics, excluding the harmonic oscillator, which is a very special system. Um, but otherwise, there's a huge distinction um, in the quantization of individual levels of the bounded system, and that can be directly associated with chaos. Now, the other object that's really basic and fundamental is the eigenfunctions. And here's an illustration of a two-dimensional quartic oscillator that's coupled. And this thing has both chaotic and regular motion in it. But if you think about um, the old quantum theory, WKB, whatever you like, if you use WKB and quantize the classical motion uh, that's shown here, uh, two examples of the quantization are on the are on the right, you actually find eigenstates that look just like that, okay? But if you look at the chaotic motion in the same system, you can't identify any of those states, eigenstates, with any particular uh, motion in the chaotic thing. So this completely fails in that regime. And uh, Barry and Voros in the 70s said, well, what you ought to really find for the eigenstates of a chaotic system is what looks like random waves. If you take plane waves from random directions, all with the same wave vector, but random phases and randomly oriented things, you get a Gaussian random field, wave field. And so it looks just like the, the random wave picture right there. Um, and the stadium eigenstate plotted in the same kind of a way is, is, is right there. Um, they are supposed to kind of look similar. It's just that um, there's edge effects. And so there's correlations, dynamical correlations built in. And if you really want to see the random wave-like nature, instead of having 50 nodes across, if you, if you saw an eigenstate that was 1,000 nodes across and you zoomed in locally, you wouldn't be able to tell that from a random wave. So, so you actually see it when you get asymptotic enough at a high enough excited uh, level in that system. Um, but that was uh, the beginning of what um, was the eigenstate aspect of this uh, quantum phenomenon. So um, instead of seeing very regular kinds of eigenstates in some sort of a way, you should see things that um, tend toward um, random waves. And eventually that property got related to what I'll later talk about very briefly, but is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is related to um, quantum systems, expectation values of operators um, approaching the microcanonical ensemble, um, even though they're from an isolated quantum system. So um, 
Heller came along in 84 and said, well, wait a minute, you know, there are some deviations from this random wave picture and he, uh, he illustrated how um, a quantum system often shows um, features of periodic orbits in their eigenfunctions. If you like, in this stadium billiard, there's a periodic orbit that just goes back and forth. It's a highly unstable orbit, just oscillates back and forth horizontally across. So any deviation from it, you have a hugely up and off exponent, you fall off of it, but you'll see eigenstates that, that seem to have memory or are patterned by these periodic orbits of the system. So that was kind of a, a um, like a first correction to the purely random uh, wave sort of hypothesis. So there, there have come to be sort of um, three groups of theoretical tools used in the subject of quantum chaos. And um, the first one I would call uh, asymptotic analyses. So anything that you think of as a semi-classical theory or that sort of thing would fall into this. And um, you know, that's like the old quantum theory, but it's like optics for Maxwell's equations. It's, it's, it's you know, the optics of Maxwell's equations is completely analogous or almost completely analogous to Hamiltonian dynamics for Schrodinger mechanics. So when you do semi-classical analysis, you're looking at Hamiltonian uh, mechanics immediately, and that's what you're working with. And so you see these things like WKB, Bohr, Sommerfeld, those things only work for integrable systems. They fail, and, and Einstein pointed that out in 1917. Then Gutzfeiler comes along and introduces periodic orbit theory. And then if you're interested in coherent states in many body systems or wave packets in molecular physics or those kinds of things, um, then there's a saddle point approximation, which at least in one context is called generalized Gaussian wave packet dynamics. But you can do um, a time dependent complex path WKB which is also a semi-classic or asymptotic analysis and understand uh, time dynamics of systems, uh, wave systems. So um, that actually makes a connection uh, again back to um, time dynamics in many body systems. Um, well, statistical methods, I already mentioned random matrix theory. Um, so the quantum pro uh, fluctuation properties are supposed to mimic those of random matrix theory. There's been a lot of work on that and a lot of extensions. Um, and uh, there's a, well, um, I guess I'm not getting technical enough to go into all the details, but there are, there are um, ensembles that are structureless. And I think a lot of the work since the original work of Wigner and Dyson where the only things they took into account were time reversal invariance or not, and whether a system had angular momentum symmetry and spin. So excluding uh, uh, that case, since then, um, they've extended all kinds of other sorts of information into ensembles. Like if you wanna study the metal insulator transition, you start talking about banded random matrix uh, theory and, and things like that. So there's a lot of extensions. Um, and uh, a sort of a third uh, theory came out of the theory of disordered systems, uh, Efetov and someone whose name I forgot, um, published a nonlinear sigma model. And um, there's a lot of diagmagnetic, diagrammatic techniques uh, that were evolved to, to deal with these uh, uh, models. And um, they're associated with the theory of Anderson localization and all of this, but disordered systems also, um, sort of come under this guise in the following sense. These three things, these three different uh, theoretical tools have really amazing um, complementary and intimate relations. For example, random matrix theory predicts certain kinds of rigid, rigidity in a quantum spectrum. The, that logarithmic rigidity that comes out of random matrix theory turns out to be exactly equivalent to the uniformity principle of chaotic dynamics in a Hamiltonian phase space. The fact that, that orbits uniformly explore the phase space um, in an ergodic way, that is an exact, you can, you can make a direct mathematical uh, mapping between those two statements. So there's this intimate connection between uh, uniform exploration of phase space 
and logarithmic uh, level agility that comes out of random matrix theory. You can do certain kinds of saddle point approximations to the nonlinear sigma model and make random matrix theory emerge from that. So there's, there's some very um, surprising uh, connections between these things, even though like the theory of Anderson localization and disordered systems was developed completely independent of anything having to do with chaotic dynamics and all of that. People have discovered these uh, relationships between them. And so that's why I kind of uh, put all of these things together under the moniker of quantum chaos is because there's these deep connections. So. So it's a logarithmically short time scale. So this is the thing that's, that, that I find kind of cute, is if you look at a, a, the most localized state you can, a wave pack at a minimum uncertainty state or a coherent state, um, you, it will deform according to the stability analysis for a logarithmically short time period. But if you think about the meaning of that, it's the logarithmic time which really cements whether you have a Lyapunov exponent or not. Right at the point where the Lyapunov exponent is emerging, it saturates and, uh, and it, stops, it stops developing according to that instability. So it mimics the chaos, but only for such a short time scale um, that um, it's right at the boundary where you really cement the Lyapunov exponent that it stops behaving like that. So, Oh, yeah. So if you take a logarithm of h bar and compare that to one over h to the dth power, the number of degrees of freedom you have, they're infinitely far apart when you take h bar to zero. There, there, there's no connection between those time scales. I mean, they're, they're just infinitely far apart. Exactly. That's, that's, that, that's been common from the beginning. So the introduction of a log time came and the first discussion of the log time was in late 70s. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I thought maybe, what, how much time do we have? Uh, I'm almost done. Um, so in uh, more recent times, um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, applications of what I would call quantum chaos in uh, many body systems. Uh, one thing that's talked a lot about uh, is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Um, and there's, there's a real question as to what is thermal equilibrium for an isolated quantum system? How do you, how do you define it? And one way that people define it is that if you take certain classes of simple observables, you can always defeat this statement by taking a complicated enough observable. But for low rank operators, one and two body operators, or certain class of simple operators, um, what you're gonna assert is that it is in thermal equilibrium if after a certain length of time, whatever state you start with, um, it approaches a microcanonical average for the system. So the expectation value of that operator uh, approaches that. Uh, and that seems to happen if you have a strongly chaotic system. It does not happen if you have integrable systems for the most part. Maybe it could accidentally happen, um, but it, it, it's certainly not guaranteed. And uh, there's another way in which it fails, which is uh, related to this subject called many body localization. And so when you have disorder in the system and you get in certain kinds of localization, um, it, it's like the system freezes out its ability to explore the whole phase space and you get non-thermal averages this way. So there's a couple of exceptions that people talk about. Um, obviously, I'm just talking about this in a really heuristic way. Um, but they, you know, if you look at uh, Shrednitsky's work uh, from the 90s, um, about this subject, 
he says what you should see is that the diagonal elements are varying very smoothly to within quantum fluctuations and the off diagonal elements are on the scale of those quantum fluctuations they're uh, exponentially small and that will happen in a quantum chaotic system so so that's one uh, regime where people have been bandying about ideas of this kind and um, the other one has to do with um, um, there are lots of places uh, in uh, the study of quantum information where people use random matrix theory in a lot of different ways um, and you know when you want to quantify quantum entanglement you're often looking at an entropy of some kind and you're interested in how correlations are growing in your system and what are the growth rates of, of these entropies with time. If you start a system off with a, an initial state that's unentangled, how rapidly will you create the, uh, the entanglement you're, you're interested in? How does uh, quantum information spread and so on? Um, and uh, we worked on a problem where we took two chaotic systems that were not communicating at all and then studied um, how the eigenstates change under weak interactions. There's an entanglement that uh, is related to the strength of the interaction. There's a universality. Uh, there's a scaling behavior. Um, it's also true with how quickly the entanglement increases between uh, two systems under uh, weak perturbation. Uh, you have a linear increase with the entropy in time, but you can map all of the curves onto a single curve for weak perturbations. So, um, there's some very uh, amusing things that happen and there's some bizarre things that happen with the saturation point. Um, there's a huge difference in this kind of a problem between starting with uh, uh, an individual, uh, a starting state that's individual eigenstates of the two subsystems versus a random state in each of the subsystems. The random state in each of the subsystems will eventually saturate at the maximum, but the one with the eigenstates will saturate um, with a term that's related to the strength of the interaction, completely unlike the other, uh, the other case. So um, that's, uh, that's something we had a little fun with. Um, people are talking about scrambling of quantum information and crudely speaking, if you make some kind of local excitation to a quantum system, you kind of wonder how fast does that get delocalized and get transmitted across the entire system and disappear into entanglement and correlations that are kind of invisible. Um, maybe that's too crude, but uh, something like that. And um, people have been using what they call out of time ordered correlators to measure uh, this dispersal. And um, there's a whole lot of applications. For example, um, I still don't understand it at all, but the statement is when you think about black holes, if they're completely chaotic and you think about holography, then there's a mapping onto a quantum field theory and, and then everything works. And so chaos is essential for all this uh, scrambling, maximum scrambling stuff with black holes um, because you gotta get, you have to have the chaos to get the mapping onto a quantum field theory, something like that. Anyways, uh, I don't claim to be an expert on that sort of thing. Um, so I'll just finish up here by um, saying, at least for my taste, um, the language of quantum chaos is very physical in the same way that I think of optics. The language of optics is very physical. When you talk about refraction, diffraction, evanescent waves, you're talking about asymptotics. You're not, it's not like you went and just solved the Maxwell's equations. You're actually talking about what the solutions can do. And that's kind of what happens um, when you use asymptotic analysis um, uh, like, for example, when you do a saddle point approximation and you look at the trajectory, you can say, well, the wave is following this path. It gives you a physical interpretation of interference and other sorts of things um, that you don't get if you don't do that kind of analysis. Um, this shows up an immensely broad set of physical contexts. I've listed um, some of my favorites here. Um, the pure and applied mathematics, you'll find it... Um, if you've heard about, you know, the connection between primes and the, and the Riemann zeta function, you, you find that the fluctuation properties of random matrix theory show up in the distribution of primes, the, the distribution of zeros on the one half line of the Riemann zeta function, the moments of L functions. It's, it's, it, there's all kinds of crazy connections between uh, 
random matrix theory and properties of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, that's an, just an example. Um, and then uh, I think I already mentioned that there's this resurgence of interest in this many body domain. Um, and there's still a lot unknown about all these inter uh, connections between all these things. So that's, that's my tutorial. Awesome, thank you so much. Any questions? Lots of questions. Oh, hi. Um, so if I, in terms of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, if I imagine some big quantum system like a lattice or something, and then I want to look at a small subsection and say, does that thermalize? You said there's two conditions when it doesn't. If you have an integrable system and if it's, or if you have localization. You can't guarantee it if you have integrability. <clears throat> In fact, I would say it's probably highly unlikely. Okay. But, but if I make that some sort of random potential. Then now you're talking about disorder. But then the question, yeah. So then it, the question is whether or not you have uh, many body localization present. So it's still not a done deal. How, uh, like, so, so, I mean, how many s typical systems would sort of have this thermalization? Or is it more typical that you have localization, like we just take a random material or something? That, if you take uh, a strongly chaotic system, a lot of numerical um, results have shown that the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis works quite well. Then when you start adding disorder, there's a question of localization length. And if the system size is smaller than the localization length and you know, these kinds of things. And so um, it gets way more complicated and maybe it's even hard to do numerics on a system big enough to, to test some of those things. I'm, I'm still not entirely clear um, that many body localization is well defined. Okay. So I know Anderson localization is, but I have some misgivings about some of it. But that. if I just took a big chunk of material, yeah. would I expect thermalization if I could isolate that and let it evolve? And, or, would, or can you answer that question or is it? Depends on the nature of the dynamics. Yeah. I don't know. I enjoy your talk. The, pedagogical things. Um, so I, I mainly think about the uh, uh, chaos in the more many body contacts. Uh, I know, you know, enormous work being done in, in previous years um, in connection with the one particle chaos uh, that you elaborated on at the beginning. So um, I think the question probably, um, you know, one can ask the same question in both contexts. Basically, uh, if you use, uh, use the field theory calculation, usually in the field theory, we cannot put a field theory in the finite box. It's a continuum field theory. So those, um, the time scale associated with the earn fast time in the single quantum mechanical limit will be taken to be infinite at the beginning. Uh -huh. Then we can look at this, um, you know, uh, out of time order correlation type of thing. Just check the Lyapunov description uh, to what extent is valid. And as you said, generically it's logarithmic. The time where this uh, chaos description is where, valid. Where the quantum will saturate. Yeah, yeah, Even it's though saturated. the classical yeah, continues. Yeah. yeah, so that, that, that's a limit where we can apply this description up to, and that limit usually is set by a, a time scale which is logarithmically associated with H bar, right? Um, but I can, you know, so this is a more extrapolation. I, I can think about, I do it in the finite, if I able to do the finite system, there's another time scale associated with, with the quantum nature, which is re related to the uh, spacing of the levels. Can right. be many body spacing, which yeah, is sure. exponentially small, or the one particle. Yeah. Uh, the question is, in, when people do the computer simulation saying the one particle context, do people see what the system does between these two time scales, which are separated yes. by many, many orders so, of magnitude. So in the context yeah. of single particle yeah. physics first, you can actually do, so there was some stuff by Barry in the yeah. late 70s, some stuff by the Russians saying that the quantum classical correspondence ended at the um, log time. Okay, so you say, oh, well, they're in fest time, you hit it, now the classical and quantum don't follow each other. And they sort of said, well, that's going to, continually, to continue to be true for semi-classical theory. And that's wrong. You can actually use the classical mechanics to predict the quantum 
far past the log time. But you have to put the quantum interference in to the various classical solutions. At the log time, you have multiple classical solutions overlapping. And if you know how to put the phases in, the classical mechanics still accurately predicts the quantum mechanics. So the same thing's true in a many body context. There is a log time, but if you know how to put quantum interference between classical field or mean field solutions back in, uh, that combination will still predict the exact quantum fluctuations and the quantum behavior beyond uh, that logarithmic short time. Now, I'm not going to claim that it can get all the way to the Heisenberg time, the spacing of uh, individual levels, but to a time scale that's algebraic, at least algebraic, and not logarithmic, which is uh, way longer. So, for example, there are semi classical theories using chaotic dynamics that predict the saturation in scrambling or in OTOX that, uh, that are seen. And they're just using uh, semi classical theory based on classical orbits and so on, and how interference works to, to predict uh, the, the crossover regime and where the saturation is. If you know semi-classics or you know full-blown asymptotic analysis and how to do it, you can make the correspondence between classical and quantum out to a much longer time period. Are there any more questions? Okay, great. Let's thank Steve again for that fantastic talk. Thank you. All right, so next, uh, to round out the workshop, we have a kind of a whirlwind talk, including Brian Somm, our department chair, Marin Mossman, and Peter Engels that are gonna uh, highlight some of the quantum work being done at WSU, uh, some of the stuff that hasn't been discussed previously. Uh, and then uh, we'll have just, uh, a short discussion after that uh, to, to round out the workshop. Oh, there it is. So, uh, Brian. Oh, is this working? Hi, thank you um, uh, for the opportunity to tell you a little about what, what I do. I just want to preface my talk by saying that um, I don't do cold atoms. Um, and so some of the, the terminology and some of the, the things that I'm talking about, the context might be a little weird given, you know, some of the, the, uh, the talk.